Chapter 3 Through the Appalachians to the Pioneers So it was, before noon on the morning of February 27, 1942, that I drove out of Washington with five retreaded tires, the War Department's compliments, to all public relations officers, a rather daring testimonial from my paper's Washington correspondent to my full integrity and sense of responsibility and an insurance policy covering one life and one color camera. At the first traffic light, I hopped out to buy a newspaper, and among the newsstand's groaning racks of westerns and love pulp, I noticed a newcomer whose cover pictured an idiot Mongol face choking with teeth. The vendor said it wasn't selling very well so far, but I reckon they figure it's sort of timely. It bore the tourist title, Jap Beast. On the way out of town, I saw a paper sign pasted across a hardware store window. It was the first ominous symptom of America with its belt tightened. It said, Zippers Repaired. After leaving US 50 and going west on 29 to 11, I drove almost a dozen miles without seeing more than one truck and one private car coming or going. It was a curious new feeling, like driving in Europe, in England, on a Monday morning. After Centerville, the white double highway narrows, and lines of cedars are planted along the tops of little hills and branch off up dirt roads. Past historic Bull Run, and all through these small rolling hills and narrow runs, divided with zigzag split-rail fences, you realize how well this Civil War landscape is known to millions of military students who have never seen America. For it is the textbook tactician's classic terrain, a checkerboard for infantry. Let us pray that the owners of pleasant Southern voices at the War Department and the conscientious young soldiers at Virginia Military Institute, which was soon coming up along the road, would learn to overcome a natural pride in such country and study resolutely the Malaya jungle, the yawning swamps of Burma, and the rice fields of the Netherlands East Indies. It would do no harm if the War Department would assign some ornery brain to advertise the fighting possibilities in the conquered lands of the Pacific, where travelers had always said the climate and what it did to the mind made war there an impossible occupation. West and always gradually south, you soon begin to know what part of the land you are in. The signs offer Virginia ham, fried chicken, hot biscuits ahead, and there is a lank young negro with bare, tough feet walking the road miles from the nearest town. You climb the Blue Ridge. It is a cold, yellow, sunny day, and the bare trees on the mountains run stiff and smooth as a comb from the peak to the winding valley. You descend into the Shenandoah Valley and stop for lunch at Luray. It is a small old town with a textile factory, a tannery, and nine denominations of churches. But in spring and summer it is a tourist center for its nearby caverns, and all the outward signs are advertisements of them, and in restaurant windows, souvenirs, and rag doll mammies. The town is deserted. On the way out, you learn that yesterday they lost sixty boys to the draft. Through the afternoon, the war begins to recede. The broad, tidy farms of the Shenandoah Valley are defined, as always, by handsome white fences. Here is a chinchilla farm, and there are pretty stables, and nothing much to worry about on a board advertising thoroughbred hunters and steeplechase prospects. But offsetting this graceful prosperity is the repeated reminder in roadside signage that fresh green vegetables will be something to hope and pray for, from here all through the deep south, all the way to Florida. Signs are the hardy standbys of Southern Highway advertising, which, when they first appear, seem to be milestones leading back into the difficult 19th century, far away from the America of metropolitan diaper services and the sulfa drugs. They are the old familiar southern ads for Black Draft Family Laxative and the dread 666 Colds Fever. 
Suddenly, you duck into a grimy industrial belt from Longdale Furnace through Clifton Forge, a railroad terminal for coal and lumber export, and thence into Covington, a dark, cluttered industrial town, once an overnight stopping place for travelers on their way through to fashionable White Sulphur Springs, west across the state line. However dreary the prospects of the coal men in Covington, you reflect as you turn past Crow Tavern, an old frame house with stone chimneys, that in their humble way they would probably resent the genteel restrictions that Crow Tavern insisted on one hundred years ago, that no more than five people should sleep in a bed. In West Virginia, snow flurries scud into the windshield, and soon it is snowing merrily, though light and dry. In the darkening afternoon, I play tag with a Department of Justice car that is being driven by what looks like a forest ranger. There appears to be no sensible explanation of this, so I hang on his heels right into White Sulphur Springs, and before evening all is made plain. He comes to a stop, gives some secret Masonic sign, and swishes out of sight up the long driveway of the Greenbrier Hotel. This hotel is one of the finest of American pleasure gardens. It stands on rising ground, overlooking a plain that has been elegantly converted into a polo field and a golf course. A hundred years ago, Southern Plantation Society and its aspirants came to take the waters by day and to carouse by night. There was even a quarter for bachelors that bore the oddly Hollywood name of Wolf Row. Today, the place is said in season to employ 1,500 natives, though the population of White Sulphur Springs is listed as something less than this. The hotel still can bed, however, a thousand of the rich, the old, the decrepit, and the fashionable. A chain barred the entrance the mysterious car had been allowed to pass through, and at the gate was hung a sign, No Entrance, Department of Justice. It turned out that the guests were inmates who, by no definition, could be called legitimate seekers after health or sin. They were about 600 of the German, Italian, and Hungarian diplomatic internees. That evening in town, over exquisite fried chicken and a melting lemon meringue pie, a very pretty and charming blonde girl spilled the gossip about them. She had a bad attack of laryngitis that made the unwanted guests sound even more mysterious and cruel than you would patriotically assume. The town had threshed through every wild rumor and could find nothing very skulking to pin on the Hungarians and the harmless Italians. There was talk of loud quarreling at night, a hush-up stabbing was hinted at, and somebody invented the entirely plausible story that some of the Italians and the Germans were not on speaking terms. It has become a point of principle, with people in the town, to insist that they never have liked Germans, Italians, Hungarians, and never will. The more heinous rumors are reserved for the Japanese, who are not here but forty miles away in Hot Springs, Virginia. I spent most of the evening padding through the quiet snow, hoping to gather material for about a dozen workmanlike bee films, but the most unmentionable crime the Japs were accused of was hissed at me by a vendor of pulp magazines. He said the foul sentence with a drawling contempt. They objected to the food. They ought to put them behind bars. I remarked that they'd do the same to our captured diplomats, but the man was unmoved. It would make no difference, he replied. They ought to poison the whole breed. It's the diplomats that start the wars anyway. Next day, White Sulphur Springs looked as if it had been born in snow. The skies were leaded gray and cloudless. I start to drive on well-cindered roads up into the Greenbrier Mountains. Ahead is White Rock Mountain, on which the snow, falling finely for the past three days, makes its timbered face look like a giant stone slab marked with graceful pencil strokes. In the mountains you come on little towns far apart but bustling. It is coal and lumber country. The lumber, you might have guessed, 
but along the highway there is no hint of the vast subterranean reach of the coal and iron mines, going thirty miles east to Lewisburg, almost seventy miles west, nearly to Charleston. High in the hills I stop at Raynau, a lumber town, and inquire about the war. West Virginia is one of the three main continental sources of hardwood. It supplies mainly white oak, poplar, hard maple, and birch. Business started to boom shortly after the defense program started, when wood was called for to replace steel and metal construction. The companies are busy supplying hardwood flooring for defense housing, but the more they were asked to do, the more demand there was for their skilled carpenters elsewhere. Since December 7th, you learn 10% of the best local carpenters have gone to the chemical industries and airplane factories. Their most enterprising mechanics have moved to the shipyards on the coast at Norfolk. The companies have begun to take on women, especially in the wood heel shop. They make most of the wooden heels for the shoes that American women wear. So already they have started to step up their usual 40-hour week to a 50-hour week. You ask how the people feel about this. It's pretty obvious that a lot of men, especially, don't like it. Some people say most don't like it. Between a lot of and most is the discrepancy between what the unions will grudgingly admit and what the employer wants to believe. A plant manager says, We surely don't mind doing the extra work, but we're sore at the delays in Washington. But mostly we're sore at the guys that strike for an extra $10 a week when the men in the draft make $30 a month. You smell around the town for the always elusive odor of morale. It is a meaningless scent. In the close embrace of the mountains, in which most of these men and women were born and will die, there is little call to know much about the war or any geography but your own. The group that appears to have responded most imaginatively to the idea of the war is the teenage children, who have, so far, bought about 50% of the town's quota of war saving stamps. A distrust has been building of homegrown fifth columnists, and the Italians who live in coal mining camps are the special victims of local suspicion. On the surface, however, there is nothing to show a new situation in lumber. The workers would appear better healed if they had time to get to Charleston to buy the new clothes they can now afford. What you bring away is a memory of a town doing business a little brisker than it can comfortably manage. The sales clerks on the telephones are pressing their agents. If you can deliver today, it'll suit us mighty good to get it. It is the same all the way through the mountains. Only a politician or a cub reporter out on his first do-or-die assignment would burrow for a war situation. The only situation to observe is the life situation that has been there for generations of men who dug for coal. For the next sixty miles, you come on small, dirty, unincorporated coal towns, with all the mean disorder of coal towns anywhere. The people live mostly on rocky banks by the highway, in tar paper or unpainted frame shanties. They are propped against the slope of the bank by wooden stilts of unbelievable frailty. Spring must be a long-to-four season, when the Lombardy poplars can start to flash their leaves again and veil the squalor of these little towns with the memorable names that crouch by the great Kanawha River. Boomer and London, Glasgow and Bell, alas, and Little Plus. But even in these towns, which might be clinging to the Elbe or Mercy, there is an occasional native touch that you would not find in Germany or Britain, a casual assertion of the American way that the inhabitants never seem to notice. In Glasgow, I went past an irregular row of these shanties. They were all without a single dab of elegance, but docked between the stilts and the flooring of one was a shining 1940 Buick. Down through the foothills the snow was melting into slush, and I leave the coal towns for a string of chemical towns, as grimy as the coal towns, only more pungent. I pass through piles of ore and silica at alloy, ready to be made into ferrochrome alloy for toughening steels. 
at Bell, a vast ammonia plant, making chemicals from salt brine. Outside the plant, new wooden sentry towers have been built, 30 or 40 feet high, and if you dawdle for a moment, the soldiers on guard begin to get curious, too. As we come nearer to Charleston, the shanties break into every sort of architectural whimsy, as if they were hectically trying to prepare you for the fabulous crustacea of the state capital and its golden dome. It is raining in Charleston, and the city is thick with shoppers from nearby towns. Out west of it, a roadside billboard announces, Wow, it's a sweet chew! And this is the cue for the approaching tobacco country. We see the first smokehouse and barns for drying. Then on through some more chemical towns, past a U.S. naval ordnance plant, built hastily in 1917, abandoned after the last war, and now puffing away furiously and guarded on all sides. By nightfall, we are on the outskirts of Huntington, and noticed billboard incitements to enlist as an air raid warden and defend your family. You recall with a shock the actual existence of Herman Goering, and wonder whose foresight has made this city, 300 miles from the east coast, aware of dive bombers. It turns out to be a colonel who is at home, but prefers to explain over the telephone how his system works. I had written his system, not intending any guile, but it appeared it was nothing less. First he told me that civilian defense in our country was made blessedly simple to organize because of the system of political districting. I threw in the obvious query here, but he came back with a resounding assurance that politics would not enter into it. They had, at least by March 1942, no appropriation from the state so the colonel charged 50 cents to join his organization. If a man was willing and looked able, even if he couldn't afford the 50 cents, they let him in anyway. He had already signed up 2,700 citizens, by which simple arithmetic should have brought in about $1,350. He was hoping for 3,000 air raid wardens to graduate from a 10-hour course based partly on literature put out by the Office of Civilian Defense, and partly on local conditions. Thousands of women, he said, were taking first aid courses. You may say, the colonel said, that most of us here are getting more war conscious every day. Whatever that means, there were probably thousands of patriotic citizens who felt it. I met a sprightly youth in a drugstore who didn't feel the same way. He said, and he was evidently speaking for himself as forcibly as the colonel, the defense set up in this town don't amount to anything more than a joke run by an old growler from last time who's packing the place with his cronies. It is quite possible that this young man did the colonel and his town a disservice. His own interest in the war was a nonchalant one. He leaned across the pharmacy counter amiably and asked for a block of rubbers, he turned to me, gave me a blithe smile, and explained that he was going in the army next week. After that, he said, I'll let him take care of me. He slipped his purchase into his coat pocket, wished me good night. I went over to the soda fountain for a drink. The soda jerk, wiping some glasses, pointed silently with his towel at a sign over the orange squeezer, Regret out of Coca-Cola. To an Eskimo, this may seem a trivial anecdote, but I walked sadly back to the hotel, convinced that the war was beginning to, if not, at last, push us around with a velvet glove, administer a gentle nudge to the American way of life. Fortified by a long sleep, I happened next morning to turn off the hot water faucet too rapidly, and the thing came to dust in my hands stuffing fat deposits of porcelain under the skin of my second finger. At the hospital, I sat waiting for a surgeon and held my right hand in a towel that took to my red corpuscles like an asp. It was not the best time to check on the war situation in hospitals, but the nurses drawled around complaining of the shortage of doctors. The young ones were going into the army, and it took time to reorganize the staff of the old and the retired. 
There probably was much more that I mentally noted at the time, but have lost forever in amnesia, for, like even the mousiest creatures born on the tight little isle, I felt it my duty at such a time to behave with ridiculous calm. As the sleepy surgeon held my finger and threaded wire through it that would have securely knotted a stallion's belly, I had the inner pleasure of hearing his aid gasping admiration at the patient's boredom. When I came to, I had forgotten all about the plight of hospital staffs in West Virginia, and lusted only for two eggs over easy. The sugar was rationed at breakfast, and there was a note on the menu requesting that you, in the interests of national defense, keep to one cup of coffee. The snow was far behind on this pleasant Sunday morning, and we were soon in small hilly country, rolling with brown grass. Just beyond Canova, so called because the Kentucky, Ohio, and Virginia rivers meet there, we pass over into Kentucky, and were rolling through small hilly country, with more unpainted barns and abandoned shacks than I had ever seen in the Dust Bowl. The U.S. Department of Agriculture's map of rural cultural regions describes it, in its unsentimental way, as containing, quote, a high percentage of low-income farms, low level of living, over one-third of farmers are tenants, relief above average, end quote. It doesn't much matter how you describe it, north-south border, the agricultural southeast, the Ohio Valley, it is the beginning of the American sad land, where there is plenty of good soil, a vast population of thrifty, willing workers, but few good tools. Where the livestock is underfed, where the tenant pays a third of his crop for the privilege of cultivating whatever land God and erosion see fit to leave him, and where he gives humble thanks when his meager crop is harvested by getting hungry mouths to eat his share. We turn in corners and see small log cabins with individual wells out front, not far enough away from their outdoor privies. A material-minded man who lives in this ragged country of Appalachia must be grateful to grow a little corn, eat a fried squirrel on Sundays, and admit that his broken sod is so peppered with phosphates that at least he has no need of fertilizer. But these people are not material-minded. They are Anglo-Celts, and in the midst of penury, they think sternly of the life hereafter. The old Black Draft and 666 signs came up as regular as proverbs. But you see every half-mile or so, nailed to posts and collapsing barns, the strong slogan of the South, Jesus is coming. Near Olive Hill, we turn a hilly bend, and the commandments are printed out on drab wooden shields, like Burma shave advertisements. The last one is left uncompleted, it just prints, Thou shalt not covet, and leaves the rest of the hideous thought to perish. You pass a few farmers, and think of saluting them as casually as may be, but there is something in their mild eyes and pitted bony faces that makes you think better of it. You decide the tobacco story can wait till Lexington. All that America need ask of these sons, by way of a war contribution, is that they should try to stay fed, pay for their shoes at the general store, and keep their philosophy to themselves. One of them stands at a broken gate, he carries a pale infant, and by his side stands a soldier in a uniform new and stiff as cardboard. There is no need to ask him how he feels about the war. As we come by, he narrows his eyes against the sun and smiles. The soldier, who is perhaps destined for the southwest Pacific, suddenly sees the New York license plate and frantically tries to make the baby also appreciate the wonder of visitors from the Never Never Land. There is a vertical line on the map a few miles east of Winchester, Kentucky, that marks precisely the beginning of the bluegrass country. The region is shaded in so plainly that you cannot believe it until you get there. But exactly where the map marks X, and without any apparent rhyme or reason, the landscape suddenly grows spacious, the wide fields turning green, the tumbling fences tauten and come out in white paint, 
and the trees are high and delicate, carefully planted to hedge off the farms. The mules give way to horses, cows, and fat sheep. It is another world. If it were a touch more gracious and commanding, you might be in Maryland's exquisite Green Spring, Worthington, and Delaney Valleys. Though the bluegrass is by no means as unique or breathtaking as its natives would have you believe, you can understand how it always must appear so to anybody driving west out of the drab, sandy ridges of Appalachia. From now on, there is every sign of a cared-for, disciplined country. A sign says, Advertising Forbidden Within Right-of-Way. There is an excellent white two-lane highway, and you drive into Winchester, ready to believe all the more ornamental legends of the southern myth. We eat in a pleasant room that has warm paneling and racing prints tempered by a jukebox. The menu offers escalloped salsify and candied yams, and for dessert there is a mellow, incomparable chess pie. Behind the fountain there are three young girls, and they too make the southern myth plausible by being uniformly pretty. The pie is good enough to ask about, but the girls can't say what it is, just chess pie. They don't know where it came from, how it's made, and when I offered the suggestion that maybe the kitchen knew, they laughed at the drollery, put a nickel in the jukebox, and started jittering mildly to, why don't we do this more often? They didn't know why chess pie was spelled that way, or even if it was spelled right. It didn't seem worth asking them if they knew about the war. From Winchester to Lexington, there is no more call to brood over the southern economy, and you think back to the scraping farmers of the eastern part of the state as characters from a comic strip in the morning's paper. Everywhere around you are hedges running trimly over hills, tidy, carefree country, few evergreens, majestic stud farms, cocker spaniels for sale, all the charming nonchalance of a landscape made for the breeding of fine horses. It would be convenient to think that this is what all of the South might be like, with a little more care and pride. But nothing could be falser. You think again of the Green Spring Valley north of Baltimore, and it strikes you painfully why the bluegrass looks the same. It is a stated country. It is not the easy best that any comfortable farmer could afford. It is the flaunted showpiece of fabulously wealthy people. The X on the map that marked the change from the rolling gullies of the Appalachians to the bluegrass was not just the pretty idea of a mapmaker wishing to separate the poor from the rich. It is a geologist's signpost marking the dramatic beginning of limestone soil. And this limestone can be bought by millionaires who want to breed bone in their showring horses. They hope to go on doing it, and among themselves, they alternate between anxiety and reassurance, saying now that maybe the cavalry will want to buy their horses, the next minute reminding each other that this is a mechanized war, and that with no possible use for thoroughbreds, the government will certainly let the Kentucky Derby go on forever, in the interests of morale. You are now in the prosperous region of the Ohio Valley, and a score of billboards inciting the farmer to sell his crop in Lexington are a reminder that this town is the world's biggest loose-leaf tobacco market. The tobacco beds are planted toward the end of March under canvas covers to protect them from the frost and insects. In May and June, tobacco is transplanted to the open fields. In August and September, cut from the stalk. In October and November, stripped prepared for market, and graded to be sold in December and January. The blow to the tobacco farmers came along before Pearl Harbor, in fact in 1940, when Great Britain cut off all exchange for foreign buying. The government tried to provide exchange to companies that normally export by setting up a loan fund and buying the tobacco itself. The acreage of the 1941 crop was only two-thirds of normal, and a whole new world away from the bumper crop of 1938-39, when 75 million pounds of loose-leaf burly tobacco were sold in Lexington alone. 
But in March 1942, you hesitate to ask the small tobacco farmer about his interpretation of equality of sacrifice. He is paid a dollar and a half a day and given a cabin on the farm. With such an endowment, he does not tend to meditate on the Founding Fathers or ponder deeply what the radio commentators tell him about the war for democracy. His life is encompassed by fear that the next year the government's enforced smaller acreage will weaken his hold on a bare subsistence. Some of these farmers wished they could grow other crops that would help win the war and incidentally keep their faces fed. The young ones know that there is nothing much ahead for them but the draft. Everybody in the tobacco business knows that there is only one irreplaceable skill in their trade, and it belongs to the man who does the grading. Out west of the bluegrass you pass into brown-grassed, untidy country again, and so it stays through the rest of the lower Ohio Valley, all the way into the Liverpool, Manchester, Cincinnati, East St. Louis amalgam of cities known as Louisville. It is Saturday night, and the town is swarming with soldiers from Fort Knox, then the chief training ground of the U.S. Armored Forces, and from nearby Bowman Field. It is the first town we have seen that looks as if it might be a city in a battle zone. The streets are rolling with dumpy, broad-faced girls, sometimes pretty in a poorly rouged way, spanning the sidewalk, six or seven of them arm in arm, breathing a kind of giggling defiance of the loitering soldiers. In this strolling swarm of humans you notice the first wives on soldiers' arms. The husband wears his uniform gravely, aware of his responsibility, and the wives look resigned and modest, putting a gentle face on an essential sadness. They are what you would like to think are the people, yes, but the people are all about you, and they are a younger, more careless breed. They may grow up into these wives, conscious of having given something to their country. But now they are enjoying the new thrill of being able to pass up not one male, but droves of them. You notice that it is by no means the trimmer ones who have the soldiers in tow. There is a startling contrast between the complexions of the soldiers and the civilians. Maybe one should not judge the civilian youth of a town by scores of thousands of young men whose daily chores start at dawn and include the driving and maintenance of tanks, motorcycles, diesel engines, and general field engineering, in hail, rain, and snow. But it is impossible to believe that the high school kids crowding the drug stores will become these tanned and restless soldiers. They are gawky and lifeless and sit around with girls whose chalky faces, patched with careless rouge, are innocent of any flicker of intelligence. You talk to some of them, and you are met with the same matter-of-fact listlessness and incuriosity that distinguished the girls in the restaurant in Lexington. Just as brashness is the abuse of the northerner's liveliness, this looks like the dull, dark underside of southern manners. The intelligent southerner gives an impression you seldom meet elsewhere in America of having his own standards and of respecting you as a mature stranger while he keeps his own reserve. But when there is no intelligence, there seems to be, in the young people at least, only the tired motions of living and a glazed animal indifference to ideas, humor, the sight of new faces, even the presence of the roving soldiers. This is an atmosphere that no European need feel strange in, for it is the seeping seediness of English provincial towns. Yet this is an American town, and it has all the American fixtures, but it looks like a town in the English North or Midlands trying to go American. In Texas, in Illinois, in Connecticut, in California, a drug store, for instance, means the image of a complete American community, a shining fountain, the taste of lush syrups, an orgy of casual friendships and smart advertising, a halfway house between brisk comings and goings, the wayside first aid station of American cleanliness and quick health. It should, and very often does, baffle the foreigner like an idiom. 
But here it is what a drugstore might be in Bulgaria or Leeds, a sad imitation by a storekeeper who once read an American novel and was filled with immortal longings. In the early evenings, the hotels are jumping with soldiers. The rooms were booked weeks ago, and this leads you to inquire about the price scale. None of the hotel managers you talk to will even tolerate the notion that he is exploiting the soldiers. But you later have ways of checking on this. You sit in the lobby and watch the soldiers come in to make their reservations. Time and again they confront a smooth clerk, ask for a room for such a date, put their hand in their inside pocket, and then catch their breath and ask the clerk to repeat the price again. Sometimes they shake their heads and go away. Most of the time they sigh and say it will have to do. The point was seldom lost on the buck private. It was one way of assuring that only officers should be accommodated. That same night I decided to stay up and see what happened to the thousands of ordinary soldiers who had no room, no hotel, no girl. It was a dreary experience, but nothing much happened to them that would choke a social worker's notebook. They walk round and round the block in twos and threes, arguing where to go, what to do, whether or not to pick up some girls. They end up in the railroad station or an all-night cafe, their heads between their arms on the table, grabbing an hour or two's sleep before they catch the bus and chase back to camp at 4 a.m. Sitting up in one drug store, I overheard a conversation at 3 a.m. between two soldiers and their girls. One boy sat bending the straw of his soda between his thumb and first finger and making monosyllabic conversation with his girl. But the other couple was deep in some sort of emotional crisis. The boy stared at her, and she looked downward at an empty plate. Then suddenly she started to cry. She climbed down from her stool and walked quickly out of the store. Her friend casually came to her feet, said good night to anybody who cared to hear, and followed her. The soldier with the straw looked down at the counter. Without lifting his eyes, he said, "'You bum, what'd you have to say a thing like that for?' The victim hotly defended himself. "'I didn't say anything. What did I say?' They both fell silent. And then the hurt one turned the other way round, saw me, and held out both hands. He looked at me in utter bewilderment. "'Tell me,' he said, "'what makes a woman cry?' I looked foolish, mumbled something about that being quite a question, and we ordered some eggs, and meditated, in the doubtless naive male fashion, on the wonder and mystery of women. "'All you ask for,' protested the blunderer, "'is a good time, just an evening, a little fun.' "'Yeah,' the friend commented, "'but you gotta watch a thing like that. A nice girl, you know. She don't figure it the way you do.' This was the last word, as it will be for the duration on many a changed relationship between soldiers and wives, rookies and pickups, hostesses at USO socials, and an evening's acquaintance. The other soldier breathed a sincere melodramatic sigh. Jesus Christ, he said sadly, I give up, with an inflection that implied he, like most other men, would never give up and would never know quite why. We talked about camp life and the feeling of being a new soldier, of K.P. and getting up early, and what it did to your weight, of laying off hard liquor, and what it did to your health, of officers, not one real officer in a camp load, not among the college boys, of rates of pay, then about girls again, and about camp entertainment. I looked around the drug store. There was hardly a soldier awake. A Negro boy was mopping the floor round the legs of sleeping men. On most tables, where they hadn't already started to pile chairs before they locked up, were a pair of sprawled cocky arms and an oblivious resting head. You wondered why men chose to leave camp just for this, for a few hours, a nameless walk around the center of Louisville, and a sandwich and an hour's collapse over a cafe table. The soldier with the straw, which by this time he had taken to careful shreds, had the answer. He was talking about the efforts of the army to recreate and distract its young. He said, You can bring over all the movie stars and radio comedians, as many as you want. You can entertain soldiers all you like, but you can't entertain them out of homesickness.
There is another alien population in Louisville that wanders round the town one or two nights a week. It is made up of humble people who speak every dialect of the American language, but do not claim any stake in the city, or indeed in Kentucky. They only sleep in Louisville, and early every morning you will see their cars, like a reincarnated junk pile, while in thousands across the toll bridge over the Ohio River, meet another convoy of cars in Jeffersonville, and go on north up Route 62. Their destination is the place they work, the world's biggest smokeless powder plant in Charleston, Indiana, 12 miles across the state line. Charleston is an old town that history abandoned. In the 1820s, the first governor of Indiana lived there, soon after the Shawnee Indians had given up all hope of retaining, and the British of annexing, this section of the Northwest Territory. Indiana had been a state only four or five years, and as settlers from Virginia and the Carolinas poured across the Ohio in horse ferries, Charleston played host to the land office customers of Jeffersonville. There was a famous tavern for wealthy travelers going north, and there is a record of a dashing inaugural ball for Governor Jennings. But from the 1820s on, nothing much was heard of the town. By 1940, it had a hundred and something houses, a steakhouse, a cafe, a couple of pool rooms, a general store and a hardware store, a small Baptist church, and a Catholic church. There were exactly 939 people living there. It was the sort of town that is too small to get on anything bigger than a state map, and when it does, they spell it wrong. Thousands who came in later were to go on calling it Charleston, as long as they stayed there. For a reason that nobody in the town has ever agreed on, Charlestown was chosen in July 1940 as the site of a smokeless powder plant. The government contract was stated to be for $25 million. However, the news got around that the army expected to employ maybe as many as 5,000 men there. Nobody knew who those 5,000 people would be. If you had stopped anybody in Indiana in the summer of 1940, they would have been as vague about it as Miss Turner, a wispy middle-aged schoolteacher, who began to wonder before most of the others how the town would take care of five times as many people as lived there. Talking with the first employment service men who came into Charlestown, she was told to expect, while the construction was underway, lumbermen from the Appalachians, men from the southern mill towns. Then, probably, there would be steel workers from the Calumet region. Then later, there would be seasonal farm labor, tomato pickers, disappointed farmers from the Ohio Valley and the Deep South. After the place is built, you can't expect anybody. In the language of Washington, Charlestown might expect a defense migration. What that would mean to the life of Charlestown, nobody could reasonably imagine, because Charlestown was to become the focus of many sorts of interest that, in 1940, were thousands of miles apart. The synthesis of them would be, without much warning, was, suddenly, the Charlestown of late 1941. But in 1940, Charlestown had little say in its own alarming future. From faraway industrial cities, the telephone wires hummed with talk of solvents and brine and ether mix. In Chicago and in Philadelphia, there were board meetings about a freight train service linking the big cities with, what's the name again? Charlestown. The human cargo that was to float into town during the following twelve months would provide a American saga that Mark Twain alone could accurately relate, for it would require nothing less than his easy mastery of a score of dialects, an eye for American river life, and a nostril as delicate as his for the pungency of people whose home is not in this or that town, but who inhabit most comfortably a continent. However, it is remarkable that not even Hollywood has mined this bottomless pit.
Since nothing travels in the direction of hungry men like news of work, they started to roll in, on foot and in old Model T's, as soon as the contract was announced in the newspapers. I asked some of them to recall how they first got to Indiana. Most of them had no trouble at all remembering. A man from a small town in North Carolina said, I seen this paper lying there on top of a bag of potatoes. Well, since the cotton mill shut down, I ain't seen no kind of decent job. My wife was always taken sick, and then we had a cyclone come into town, blowed some families all to pieces, geese, bedstead, fences, everything. We was just scared about to death. That was in 36 or 37, understand. So when I seen this thing in the paper, I said, Ma, I'm taking the automobile and going north to get me a job in that defense factory. Next day I was on my way. Sorry to whoever knows what the accurate accent would have been. About the same time, 700 or more miles to the north, was a Vermont man, a French-Canadian born 75 miles from the Canadian line. I've been a house painter mostly on the eastern shore of Maryland. My son married, got a job down here in Louisville, and took to keeping home down here. Well, they told me about the factory going up, and my wife and I started down right away. There was a scrawny, cheerful-looking little man from the Lakeland country of Florida. He said, I left Georgia when I was a little fella. Never seen I been scraping round, tending lines, picking oranges. Nothing ever happens in Florida. "'Twas on the radio I first heard it, I reckon. "'I says to my old lady, "'Sue, I says, we're heading for Charlestown. "'She says, where's that? "'I says, I don't know, but we're heading there. "'We're leaving Florida for good and all.' "'A huge, clean-shaven, blonde man with faint blue eyes "'smiled when I asked him if he could remember. "'Do I remember? "'Yes, sir, I was in Detroit and in heap trouble, "'what with being laid off at the automobile factory "'and my wife pregnant.' So a man was through Detroit from my hometown, Hutchison, Kansas, and he told me they wanted millwrights. When I went back and told my wife, I said, what are you going to do? And she said, any place you can live, I can live too. We had $17 and a tire with a bad hole. Anyway, we took off for Charlestown. To the original 900 inhabitants of the place, it seemed that the whole world had had the impulse to take off for Charlestown. The expected 5,000 came and stayed and were joined by another 5,000. Highway commissioners were called in to do something about a transportation crisis that threatened to stall the whole project in a murderous jam of automobiles outside the factory gate. There had been an ordinary two-lane oiled road. By the time there were 14,000 employees, it took them 50 minutes to get in and park their cars from the moment they hit the main entrance. On the other side of the road, the trains arrived while the automobiles were still going in. The commuters started to come across the tracks. The two steams met, and, according to the plant manager, you'd hear nothing but honking horns and train whistles for the next thirty minutes. So, they had to stagger the train schedules and construct a divided four-lane highway over which they built three overpasses to pour commuters into the plant area so they wouldn't tangle with the cars coming in. The railroads had to put in more spurs connecting branch lines as far away as six miles from the vast plain that was the factory area. The police commissioner appointed three police posts more than they ever allowed for, added a dozen patrolmen, a flock of parking officers, a half-dozen more sentry towers. By this time, the original contract figure of $25 million had been trebled. By this time, too, at the peak of construction, there were 26,000 men working there. You go along to the administration building and enter the employment office, or what they call the bullpen, the office was designed neatly as a reception room for prospective employees, but it looks more like a stockyard. Hundreds of men are milling round the receptionist's desk and squatting down in the adjoining corridors. They are leaning, standing, pushing. One young negro is lying fast asleep, washed up against the far wall of the office. They are dressed in every sort of shirt and pants known to the mail-order catalogues. The early settlers would recognize themselves in all of them. All that is missing is a man in a coonskin cap with a rifle. The noise is suffocating. 
The ones nearest the receptionist's desk shuffle nervously, waiting for application blanks. Through the din of conversation, they throw single sentences to the harassed girl. I'm from Ohio. How do I get to see? I want to see the transportation foreman. I came to look for a fitter's job. I'm from Chicago. I was steered here by a gauge grinder. The girl bangs a rubber stamp in monotonous two-four time and shouts, Fill out this application form. Bring it in here tomorrow. Fill out this application form. Bring... A man's voice from one of the corridors yells for, Reifer! Jacob Reifer! Consults a sheet of paper and tries, McCoy! Timothy McCoy! The men in the corridors hold their application forms in their hands and wait to be called for their interview. The interviewer looks down at his paper again and shouts, Heisman, Alvin Heisman? Oh, there you are. You got your separation papers? Okay, come with me. Once they're hired, they go through a series of rooms for a vision test, x-ray, and fingerprints. Thus they are signed, sealed, and delivered to the manufacturer of smokeless powder. Many thousands in 1941 came out of this office to a wife parked on a muddy field in an automobile and brought the glad news of a steady high wage for the duration. Then they looked around for a place to sleep. But very early in the game, Charlestown and Jeffersonville had filled and rented every room in stores and houses that could hold a bed or trestle. Hundreds came in trailers, till every muddy patch of brown ground was black with them, like beetles on a dung heap. A Texan and his wife had tried in sequence, sleeping in a drugstore cellar, a firehouse, a barn with a patched roof, a trailer, and for a time had parted to share a bed with somebody of their own sex. The man from Hutchison, Kansas, who came down from Detroit, agreed that it was no place to be having babies. When we got to Charleston from Detroit, we had $8 left, and they wanted $15 a week for one end of a trailer with an old sheet dividing it halfway. So we bought a small tent on time, Sears and Roebuck, and pitched it down near the river. When summer came, my wife hitched a ride back home to her folks to have the baby. It was quite an experience. There were many mothers in Charlestown who undoubtedly looked on this man's wife as being much too fastidious. Most of them stayed and had their babies with the help of Miss Turner and the grace of God. By the late winter of 1941-42, Miss Turner had delivered or assisted at the birth of something like a couple of hundred young Hoosiers. Through a winter and a spring and a steaming rancid summer, they came and settled and somehow stayed fed and alive. By the fall of 1941, the construction gang was almost gone, and it was a memorable day when, on one side of a trailer, there was painted the unbelievable words, For Sale. Somebody was making room. But 15,000 stayed, of every shape, name, and heft under the American sun. Vermonters and couples from Oregon and Colorado full of disdain for anybody who said the grass was green in Indiana. Californians who sat around in the evenings and described to a skeptical audience the smell of orange groves and the grace of pepper trees. Kansans who affected to feel cramped for the sight of wheat again, stretching from your toes clear to the horizon. There were New Englanders who fussed over the chowder and sighed for soft-shell crabs. There was a girl who wanted to go back to Texas because she missed the Neiman Marcus dress ads in the Dallas News. You ask them if they will go home when the war is over, and ironically, it is only the New Englanders, the original pioneers, who are determined they will go back home. A quiet, stooped lad with glasses, listening to some of this proud talk, stamped on a cigarette and said, Go home? Why didn't they stay where they came from, anyway? This is a natural thing. Where would America be if hundred years ago everybody had stayed home? It was the only sentence I heard from anybody that showed an instant historical sense of the Charlestown boom. An old man in his eighties had said, There never was a thing around here to give a man a day's work but what went bluey. In the evening you read the bitter truth of this remark in the history of southern Indiana. 
A hundred years ago, they came in similar droves, with equally high hopes. They did not suffer from trailer troubles, and they died by nothing they knew of as a strepococcus, but they had Indians and cholera. You have only to go into an Indiana graveyard to realize that they came young to Indiana, and most of them died young, unredeemed by bloodletting, whiskey, and the incantation of local proverbs. Especially, you will notice the graves of young girls buried with the babies they were too ill to bear. On one of these is the inscription. Thirteen years I was a virgin, two years I was a wife, one year I was a mother, the next year took my life. French Jesuits and Welshmen sleep side by side with Presbyterians and Quakers, Virginians and Irishmen. They say that as far up the river as Cincinnati, you could look south from the bluffs on a clear night and see, over one hundred miles away, a glowing arc against the horizon. It was the Charleston smokeless powder plant, with its sweating, joking, cursing mess of humans with license plates from every state in the Union. A lot of people in Louisville and across the river deplore the boom and the invasion by strange people far from the ways they were born to. But you think of those tombstones again and have to admit that the boy with the glasses and the stoop had the word for it. This is a natural thing. Though they came in jalopies and worked on smokeless powder, it was an American migration in the classic tradition. Many of the natives said contemptibly, that these invaders weren't Hoosiers, and never would be. But it required only the ministrations of a midwife to change all that. For who is a Hoosier or a Missourian? The French and the Kentuckians went into Missouri, and Missourians made Oregon. That ends chapter 3. Thank you for listening to that.